So just while we're waiting for our attendees to join, I'll just let everyone get comfy and, uh, and settle in. Um, this usually takes a, a minute or so, so we'll, uh, we'll let everyone join in before we formally kick off. Okay, our attendee numbers are starting to uh, come in now. So uh, while that's still occurring, what I thought I might do uh, is uh, just give a quick introduction, first of all, to the purpose of this call. Um, and then we can uh, do a bit of a round the grounds and, and an introduction. And I know there's, there's a lot of uh, interest in the micro small cap sector at the moment. So we thought it would be a useful exercise to bring some of the, the, the more connected and smarter minds in the space uh, together to have a, an informal, in, informal and informative chat. Um, I would stress that the, um, the, the information that's being shared uh, is clearly not financial advice and shouldn't be taken as such. Uh, mm. And if there is any, any follow up that um, particular attendees or registrants want to do, uh, they can either do that directly uh, with the panellists uh, or talk to their own advisors. So without further ado, uh, maybe what I should do is introduce our panellists uh, and I'll let them give a, a sort of a, a minute to two minute introduction to their respective business and starting ladies first. Angie, oh, over to thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much. Thanks, David, for having me on the panel. So I'm a private investor and um, hopefully you're following me in the Sydney Morning Herald, the age shares race that comes out every Sunday, which is like just a um, sort of fictitious shares race that comes out. It goes for either four or six weeks. And so I've won that many times. So I get a bit of a following on that and very active on Twitter and LinkedIn. So definitely I like to connect to people through Twitter and LinkedIn. So if you've got um, questions you want to follow up, I'd love to hear from you. So yeah, mm -hmm. happy to be here. And yeah, I'm a full-time investor. I've been investing full-time for over six years now. Great. And Mark? Yeah, um, so I run a kind of media events companies focused on the microcap space called Coffee Microcaps. Uh, you can follow us at um, C Microcaps. We also have our own uh, YouTube channel, Coffee Microcaps, and we're also on LinkedIn. Um, I started, I guess, at Wilson Asset Management. I think maybe a lot of people have, would have heard of Jeff Wilson. I was an equity analyst there. Uh, looking at small and micro cap companies. Um, and yeah, now I try to provide a platform for industrial micro cap companies listed on the ASX. So that's kind of a broad range of companies, but kind of anything outside of the junior resources space or the biotechnology space. So that can be looking at technology companies, finance companies, uh, media companies, small telcos, hardcore industrial engineering, hardcore industrial products companies. And yeah, it's really just trying to connect microcap investors um, with good microcap companies and, and try and bridge the gap between the two of them because I find um, there's a lot of good stories out there. And with so many microcaps on the ASX itself, um, it can be hard for a lot of these companies to kind of get their story out there and get their message across. Yeah, and Paul, Canary Capital? Yeah, Canary Capital is a boutique uh, broker. We're based in uh, the head office in Sydney, but we've also got uh, representation in Melbourne. We focus very much on the small cap uh, stocks. Uh, we look for particular characteristics um, like strong management team with proven track record of success, clear business strategy. It's very important that the opportunities we look at, we have um, are globally scalable. We prefer to have high barriers to entry. Um, we also look at trends. We try and identify trends that are occurring and then we'll go and look for opportunities based on those trends that we think are going to outperform the general growth of the market. So there's, there's six areas we look at at the moment, but maybe I'll get into that later. Um, yeah, so, and we usually, we take a very long-term view in companies that we invest in. Uh, we always invest alongside our clients. When I say long-term view, it's probably oh, three, five years, even longer. Um, and we'll stay with them all the way and do anything we can do to help them succeed. Great. And Ben, Fresh Equities. Thanks, David. So Fresh Equities is a 
uh, a platform for investors who want to get access to capital raises. Uh, all ASX companies, so we've been around about 18 months. Uh, I think it was last week we just crossed over 500 placements or shortfalls. So, you know, the panel is probably a, a good example of this. It's if Angie's a, an investor and interested in a, in a deal and Paul's running it, but they don't know each other, uh, it's a good way for, for them to, to join up. Uh, so yeah, so we've been doing that. It's about a hundred million dollars that we've processed. Um, and we are big advocates of small caps and we're a big advocate of, you know, giving broader access. So making sure people can get into what they want, really. So, yeah. Great. Now, um, and thanks for that introduction. Clearly today we're talking about small cap and micro cap stocks, uh, which for a lot of people have a lot of interest because they're, they're clearly tradable stocks and in a lot of cases, um, there's money to be made and lost. So um, what I thought I would do is, is maybe Paul, you touched on the six, the six areas that you focus on. In, in a time like now, what's the, what's the investment thesis? What's the, the focus of, how, of, of identifying the type of stocks that you want to invest in on behalf of yourself or clients? Um, and then how do you sort of nut them down out of a sector into the ones that jump out? I think in the, in the new world we're in now, it's going to become more and more important that companies that we invest in uh, either have substantial cash flows or approaching cash flow positive um, or the potential is so near term that you can put up with it. Um, it's going to be, I think it's going to be uh, much harder for companies that have got large amounts of debt going forward. Um, so yeah, we, we, we really, it's really important that, companies have clear, clearly defined path to significant revenues or, or, or they have them already. And, and the companies which I'll talk about today, actually all of them have, have already substantial revenues. Um, like I said earlier, there's two things that are the most important that we're, when we're making investments, people and project. People comes down to management. Can you trust them with your money? Are they... Um, have they had a history of success? And as far as the projects go, how likely are they to generate profits for, for shareholders? And, and that's where it comes down to scalability, um, making sure that there are high barriers to entry uh, so that things can't be copied. Um, so the advantage that the company generates when they build a business is the longer term. And in terms of... Are there specific sectors or, or um, areas that you focus focus on, or is it a, a wide brush? No, it, it, there there are specific areas. Um, so about 2013, cybersecurity we we thought was going to become an important area, and it certainly did. So we've got a number of companies there that we've backed. Um, uh, in they're actually in the they're, they're private, so they're unlisted, um, but they've been. Uh, well, a couple of them have been doing very well. Um, look, there's biotechs, certain parts of biotechs in terms of regenerative medicines or, or new treatments for chronic diseases. Uh, minerals, um, we're interested in precious metals, obviously, gold, um, uh, silver. Getting more interested in uranium because there's a shortage there. Uh, Drone technology is another area that we're we're following um, because we think they're going to it's it's going to be a game changer uh, in terms of how goods are delivered. Um, agri agricultural technology, uh, we, there's more and more people on the planet. We've got to feed them, uh, so technology is going to improve the productivity of food production. And finally, the other area which we think is really important particularly for the upcoming generation is the is global sustainability. So we look for companies which are, if it's a miner, we want them to be recognising the ESG, environmental social governance, um, or if it's another company, um, we want to make sure that they're making a contribution to that area. And Angie, as a private investor um, and a long-standing and successful private investor, What's the, what's the current market throw up from a, an investing thesis? Have things changed for you in how you look at companies? And, and if so, what, what's the current sort of area of focus? 
Yeah, so with me, I'm definitely, uh, I was very lucky to, in October last year, catching up with another investor. When, when we called up, he said to me, Angie, you know, what would you do if the market opened 50% lower tomorrow? And this was quite, sort of a bit of a shocking question for me. And I thought, oh, God, what would I do? And then from, from October last year, I, I really, from my portfolio, was a lot stricter with my stops and just just looking at, at the, the stocks that I'm holding, because I was in quite a diversified portfolio before this correction. I was in about 65 stocks, which is quite a lot. So following those stocks was a lot of work. So with that, I think in this sort of environment, I was very lucky that that had happened in October because you know, I was quite prepared um, before this correction came where I was just constantly looking at my portfolio and just saying, well, what would I, you know, not necessarily always looking for the next big high flyer, but just always looking at what I'm holding in my portfolio and saying, okay, well, are they coming across any sort of headwinds? What's going on with their customers? What's going on with their suppliers, employees, and just, just constantly looking if I need to exit out any of those positions. So that, that's been fantastic for me. And definitely in, in this environment, I've got out very early on out of all my retail and travel stocks and definitely the stocks I'm holding in my portfolio all are doing very well in this environment. So the new stocks that I've been adding all have, have had good um, um, quarter three figures, increased revenue, like like Paul was saying, you know, they definitely need to have cash and a good runway for cash and they need to be taking advantage of this environment. And are there any thematics? Is there any any specific areas that you've sort of grouped all your stocks into? Uh, I definitely have, because I've got a tech background, I definitely have quite a few SaaS businesses. I definitely like global SaaS businesses, and but I've rebalanced them from from more travel related SaaS businesses to other ones that are doing, doing better in this environment. And yeah, not holding any of my, um, you know, favorite retail stocks like LaVisa got rid of all, all my favorite sort of stocks quite sadly and all my lovely travel stocks. But yeah, I've got a bit of gold, gold stocks and um, yeah, just, just other sort of interesting things. Um, um, and Mark, you obviously look at a lot in this sector and, and offer the platform as well for these companies to reach investors. First of all, um, from an investor perspective, the, the investors you're talking to, are there, are there themes that are, are coming out or is there a, a new investing normal that's being created at the moment in the small micro cap end? Uh, and again, when you're looking at these stocks, what are the ones that are jumping out at you? Um, yeah, I think from the investors I'm talking to, um, I think there's definitely a new normal is going to emerge out of this. I think similar to what happened in the GFC, like people learned lessons there that they're still applying in their like kind of process today. I'm sure Paul and Angie can say that, you know, less hard lessons learned there are definitely still being applied today. I think the same is going to come out of this crisis. Um, as I've been saying to people i think people are now when they're analyzing stocks there's going to be like what i call a pandemic premium in other words companies that haven't been affected in any way shape or form from this are now going to trade you know into the future people are going to ascribe it as some kind of premium to that similarly the other way around like the retailers travel stocks um hospitality stocks anything where you know it's been affected by lockdowns whether in australia or globally i think there's going to be what i call a disease discount applied to those you know going forward people are going to be if we have you know a second wave third wave of the coronavirus or some other global health thing that puts us back in this situation again you know people are going to remember that um in terms of other things trends i'm finding with uh, microcap investors that i speak to they are throwing the net far and wide because they realize that, you know, in the GFC, you know, there were some great opportunities and they recognize now this is another time for great opportunities. So people are throwing the net very far and wide and um, trying to find things, as I say, you know, the, the baby been thrown out with the bathwater, they're trying to find the baby, you know, they're trying to get in to names that, you know, haven't been this cheap in a long time. And, you know, the volatility has thrown up a lot of opportunities and people are trying to capitalize them 
uh, as quickly as possible. So I think one definitely one of the things I know some investors are doing, people are doing a lot, lot more research and going a lot, lot wider than kind of what's in their current portfolio to try and take advantage of this um, if they maybe were a bit younger, kind of maybe missed out on the GFC opportunity, they realize, you know, we're, we're you know, 10 years on from the GFC. Um, so, you know, this kind of market dislocation, you know, could be years away before a, a similar opportunity presents itself and they don't want to miss it. And just, Ben, uh, and before I do, I'll just remind attendees that they can ask questions through the Q&A function. So if they want to ask a question, please uh, write a question down and, and I'll throw it to the panellists. Ben, uh, one of the themes that's clearly come out from uh, the three people who have spoken before yourself is that cash is king and, and clearly you track uh, who's raising, how much they're raising, what they're using it for. What are you seeing? Are there any trends emerging in the micro cap, small cap end um, around cap raisings and, and sort of going early, not waiting too long, going maybe for a bit more than normal? Is there anything you're seeing? I think, I think there's a few things. So if you look at the top end, uh, you know, we've all seen the cochleas, the next DCs, et cetera, raise. There's been, uh, like, I think, just over 10 billion raised so far since rescue raises really came in. It's, it's quite interesting to look at them. And we, you know, Mark was comparing it to the GSC before. I think in the, in the GSC, the discounts were sort of around 11 to 12%. Now we're seeing the average discount at about 18%. So it's actually cutting, like these larger stocks are cutting bigger discounts. I think at the, at the small end, um, the raises that we've seen and the raises that we've seen get up have been hugely supported by existing holders. So, you know, it's really existing holders backing their, um, I guess their portfolio, right? And their book. And outside of that, it's getting more difficult. And I think that a lot of smaller stocks you know, a, a, a potentially blindly hoping that the market will bounce back up and their, you know, their, their four cent stock will go back to be worth seven cents because that's what it was a couple of months ago. Um, and, and so holding back or they're doing raises that just aren't priced, you know, they're priced at a less of a discount than an ASX 200 stock, which is just, you know, it's, it's, it's a bit crazy. So, what we're seeing is people are starting to come to terms with this a bit, I'd say, uh, and starting to understand that it's not going to be a um, very aggressive V uh, bounce back and that they're, they're likely to start putting in plans in. And, you know, to what Paul was saying before, cash is kind of king, right? Like, you know, it's, it, it, and, and on both sides of the aisle, cash is king for companies and for investors. Um, you know, Angie and I were talking the other day that she, uh, she cashed out pretty early on in the year. So she's in a very good spot um, to take advantage of a, a lot of these things. So, um, yeah, I think that the, the small end will still stay quiet for a little bit as they come to grips with the new world. And, that, and it's probably a bit easier to, you know, maybe not um, do the next drilling campaign and postpone that for a couple of months or... Um, postpone some development uh, for a tech play or, or remove or reduce marketing spend. So they've, they've got a, you know, probably an easier time of reducing their expenses and, and writing out, but, you know, there's, there's going to be a lot of raises. We, um, we recently analyzed all of the 4C data and 5B. So the, the quarterly cash flows that these small stocks need to put out, the sort of the smallest 800 stocks on the ASX and about 250 of them have to raise by Christmas, uh, one and a half billion, uh, otherwise they die. And there's, there's no sort of getting around that. So there's, there's gonna be a lot of the small guys coming onto the market soon. So one question that's just come through um, is, do you think the small cap index will fall further after the full year 20 reporting uh, comes out as banks downgrade earnings? Do you think that'll have a flow on impact on the smaller, the micro cap stocks? Maybe Paul, I'll start with you and I'll, I'll go around the grounds. Yep. Um, I, I think some sectors will fall by more than others. Uh, I think there's a lot of action at the moment in the, um, in the speculative gold market and interest. So I think that's an area that, that is actually gonna go up. 
with regards to technology, um, or, or even general companies that can implement their solutions or their products remotely are likely to do better versus those that in this environment have to have people on site, then obviously that's going to be difficult to generate revenue. So I think that's that's certainly something that's going to, um, going to hold things up. I, in terms of the general small cap sector, I, to me, it's already been pretty hardly beaten down. Um, and I actually, unless the markets have another I don't know, thousand point fall. I, I don't see huge fall in stocks. I think it'll be more selective rather than just across the board. Um, can I just add something to what, what Angie said earlier too? Um, we used to, I, I used to own 60, 70 stocks as well. I've got it down to about 40 now, which is still too high. But the market itself has completely changed. I think in the last 10, 15 years, I used to trade a lot. I, don't, I hardly trade at all now. To me, the, where the big money is made is by identifying really good companies and taking big positions in them. I call it, you know, building, making golden baskets. And as they come up, come off, once you get one basket, you have to take some eggs out of that basket and try and make a new one. And in other words, find another company that, that is worth backing. So I, yeah, I agree with what you said earlier, Angie. I've just got to get my portfolio yeah. count about 20 stocks instead of 40. <laughs> And Mark, what do you think in terms of, is there further to fall or is it just going to be really selective now? Um, I kind of agree with Paul. I think it's going to be kind of selective. There'll be sectors that do well, sectors that maybe get downgraded. But I mean, I did some work on the ASX Emerging Companies Index and, um, you know, specifically kind of the volatility we saw in March. And a couple of things that came out of my research was, you know, March was the most volatile month for that index since it started in, in 2003. Um, it was way ahead of any month in the in the GFC, like October 2008 was like the worst month volatility wise in, in 2008. March was like way above that. Um, and, you know, people always say, well, the whole market was down, you know, everything was down, um, you know, overseas as well. You know, it's, uh, you know, it wasn't just unique to Australia, but I'm just getting the numbers up here for the ASX microcap index is actually one of the worst performers globally. So if you take the MSCI world microcap index, it was down 19% in March. The US guys, you know, were down um, that low 20s, 22, 23, depending on which one you look at. The UK was down 26, but the Australian one was down 31.1% in March alone, just like a single month. It's worst ever, it's worst ever month since the index started over 16 years ago. So, you know, I, I'm kind of appalled, you know, there'll be sectors that do better or worse, but unless we get a very big downdraft at the top end of the market, I think, you know, there's, it's, it's fallen a lot already. And, you know, and February was also down. So if you add the two of them together, you know, for the micro caps in Australia, you're talking over 40% down. Um, but as my old boss, Jeff Wilson, used to say, you know, a stock can have and then it can have again. So I guess an index can have and it can have, it can have again as well. Um, but, uh, you know, to me, I think a lot of, a lot of things have gone down um, across the board. So I, kind of find it hard to believe that on an index broad level that you know we're going to see another big downdraft so is that partly mark do you think the the market's already done the big shakeout so the ones that that, that um, the big lights shone to show are in a bit of trouble the lights are already shining on them so now it's the ones that have have in some respects got through um, are likely to keep on skating yeah, I, I think that's true. I think it's like, a, a, as Ben said, you know, the uh, and Paul as well, you know, the, you know, ones with debt or, you know, ones who are maybe a long way from um, cash flow break, even profitability, you know, people have like completely refocused away from, from, from those into things that are approaching cash flows, break even are already profitable. Um, and, you know, they're like Angie, but I think, people are like reorganizing their portfolios and that appetite for, you know, pre-revenue stuff, 
Um, no matter how exciting the technology is, whether it's in the biotech space or the tech space, um, or maybe even uh, resources is a little uh, bit different, obviously, because you've got, you know, gold doing so well and a couple of the other metals. But I think there's definitely been a refocus away from those more kind of longer term stories to, you know, what's coming up in the here and now that doesn't require, you know, big cap rate. And I mean, we've seen some, you know, I've started a, a, a tweet on it uh, to, to keep it up, like some of the most deeply discounted cap raises that have come through in the micro cap space. I mean, Dacian Gold raised at 79% below the last traded price. Um, uh, what was the other one? Osprey Medical. They did a three for one uh, rights issue and they thrown in uh, a one for one bonus bonus option on top of that. I mean, that is incredibly discounted numbers for existing shareholders. Um, but I think it showed up that, as you say, it shunned the big spotlight on um, low quality projects and to borrow Paul, you know, low quality projects and low quality management teams. Okay, so the million dollar question, we're talking small caps and micro caps, and I will preface this is, I assume in your answer that you either have an investment in uh, or, or some other form of interest in the stocks. But firstly, Angie, to you, what, what do you, when you look at your portfolio or things that you've bought in recent months, what are you looking at and loving and why? So particular companies? Yep. Um, yeah, so one of the one of the stocks that I quite like is um, BTH, Big Tin Can. So this is a company that um, helps sales people learn faster and sell smarter. So it provides software for sales people, and it, it's doing really well in this environment. Like ninety eight percent of their revenues recurring, sort of contracted revenue, and most of their contracts are about a year and. They've reiterated their their guidance. So on the um, in twentieth um, of March, they they confirmed their guidance. So they said, yeah, our revenue is going to be up thirty to forty percent, just like we said year on year. And yeah, I've I've trying to sort of use their software, and I, I try to sort of you know to get to know these companies. I do like to try the products, as you all know, and you know get sort of quite hands on and watch all the videos and try to connect with their customers and their competitors just to see what's sort of unique about their software. And I quite like the offering and it's a, it's a global company. They've got $27 million in the bank and 32 million of recurring annual recurring revenue. So BTH is a, a, a company I actually sold out um, early on and sort of bought back in just recently. So I sort of missed that drop where I was quite lucky and, and yeah, it's, it's a company I sort of have been getting to know I've, over the past quite a few months. Um, yeah, there's a few others. Um, Open Learning, OLL, that's a company that I've spoken about before and they, they have um, um, online tools for, for universities and education providers. They offer it to over 62 different education providers so they can create these amazing online courses, which is just, I, I'm surprised they're not doing better in this environment because a lot of more education providers are, are going to online learning experiences. And they, they move the learning experience for students away from that very static, instructivist sort of technique of learning to a very active, connected approach so the students can interact um, very easily and on specific parts of the course. So I was very lucky when I was in Sydney late February to go out to their offices in Surrey Hills in Sydney. I trekked out there when I was at an investment conference and got, got a really good demo of the open learning platform and saw some of the tools that they, they use for their universities and education providers. And there was one fun one where there's this um, chatbot that was created um, in 1966. And it's like an er early Siri where you can ask um, this Eliza chat box questions and then she will answer you. So you can go through this exchange with Eliza and then you can post the, the results. So in the open learning platform where one of their education providers was creating a course for AI, the students could actually interact with this chatbot and share that, that chat that happened and the students could talk to each other about it. So they've just got all these amazing tools in the platform. So 
they're doing really well. They listed in December. So it's quite a new business. Okay. Now I know you've probably got a few more and there'll be some questions coming through, but Paul, what about from a Canary Capital point of view? You did say that you'd like to take uh, where possible long positions and large positions. Mm -hmm. Are there uh, you're doubling down on now and particularly what, how they're performing in this market? Uh, look, companies that we like will we'll invest as they require more capital to complete acquisitions. Um, there's a couple that we're, we're really keen on at, at the moment. I'll talk about, I'll talk about three um, very briefly. Um, so there's uh, software as a service business, uh, a couple in that space. Um, K2 Fly, current market cap's about 20 million. They're, they provide software to mining companies and they've got a couple of key solutions. One's called Infoscope, which is all about uh, land management, but also there's a number of modules, eight modules in that, and, and it deals with things like heritage and uh, land access, uh, environment. So it's right across that ESG platform. So uh, a big client there of theirs is uh, Fortescue. Um, they have 400 users logging onto this product every day and it's spatial awareness so people across the organization can zoom in on a tenement and find out what exactly what's going on there in terms of um, issues uh, that, that could potentially cause uh, cause problems and there was a case where they were about to go and dig up um on a, dig, do some drilling on a tenement and it actually had a some orchids or, that were endangered if they had have done it that they would have lost those, but um, because of the system, it stopped it. So, and the other product that they've got is called RQ. Now it's a resources and reserve reporting uh, software system. Um, the all companies listed on the NYSE have to abide by new regulations by January 2021. And this software is the only commercial off the shelf solution that is available uh, to these companies. Alternatively, they can go and develop their own. So they've signed up some really big clients in recent months. New, Newmont, 900,000 over three years. Rio Tinto, 1.5 million over five years. Newcrest Tech. Sabelco, which is actually a private company, was signed this week. They're not even listed on the NYC, but they want to improve their um, their uh, internal, um, what do you call it? The quality of the, the, the information they're putting out. Um, They've got proof of concept with Barley and, and South 32. So look, they're, they're growing very quickly. It's recurring revenue, um, market cap's quite low, and there's a big opportunity to cross sell once they're into the big companies. So that's one. Um, the, the second one I, I talk about is, is uh, Pointera. Now Pointera, Pointera is very interesting. It's, a, um, it, it's hard for some people to grasp, but when companies are capturing 3D data, for example, scanning a, a building, creating a, a digital asset twin, it generates a huge amount of data and it's very hard to, to host and to, to manage and, and get value out of. Pointera have developed a platform which enables company to, to do just that. They, they host the data for them and, and customers can, can log in, use this system remotely. So again, it's both these companies can deploy remotely, so they're not affected by the current environment. And, um, and they can get value out of the data. And a, a really good example is for, for that company is they're currently in, uh, active in America. So a lot of their revenue is being generated in US dollars. But there's a utility, one of the largest utilities in the country is, is doing a complete um, uh, mapping of their poles and wires. And uh, they'll host it on Pointera's platform. And then they can go and run analytics, which Pointera get paid more for, to identify potential problems with poles or where there's vegetation getting too close to the wires. Um, so, and, and their revenue has been growing uh, significantly uh, in recent times. So that's another one we like, and, uh, software as a service. And uh, the other one, which we, we actually came about through a, a takeover last year, a, a, um, sorry, an acquisition last year is a company called Harvest Technology. It used to be called Smart Marine Systems. And they bought a business called called uh, advanced offshore streaming. Now this this is cutting edge technology. Basically what they've been able to do is, is compress video and voice and data um, 
that's and then send it encrypt it above military grade and then they send it across uh, satellites now what this enables them to do is um a it what they're using it for at the moment they they have a there's a telstra um satellite communication center in nangara in perth and fugro who's one of their partners they are using the technology so they can sit in the in perth and they will i went and visited the center and they will be doing using robotics uh underwater surveys of the rankin platform for example checking that everything's okay so and this is all done remotely and high definition definition video they're streaming 128 kilobytes a second not ki not megabytes kilobytes so it's it's going to generate huge amounts of cost savings for for uh, companies going forward and the technologist has so many applications in defense and uh, meets streaming media um it, but it's 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 just new it's new technology and the other thing which i'd say about it is the west australian government has just um put two and a half million bucks into a, a new program called a rose which is the australian remote operations for space and earth nasa is a partner the technology that will be used there to to control robots in space and stream video back is harvest technology. It's it's under the radar at the moment. A lot of people don't know about it, but it's I think it's going to be a global company. Beautiful and Mark, yeah. yeah, perfect. And Mark, um, from your perspective, maybe not from an investment perspective, uh, more from an analyst perspective. Are there any any stocks that you're currently following or or looking at that are jumping out in in this particular market? Yeah, I think um, one I've followed uh, for a while now um, is um, MedAdvisor, MDR, the codes capped at a hundred million market cap. So they basically provide um, software services to improve um, medication adherence by kind of generally patients who are on chronic medication. You know, that can be for like HIV, hypertension, um, um thyroid issues and they basically link up everybody in the chain so they link up the doctors the pharmacies the big pharmaceutical companies and the patients to try and improve health outcomes across the board but also to increase efficiencies for everybody in there so for the doctors you know they can do um, um renewal scripts without you know just logging on to the app that gets sent straight to the pharmacist the pharmacist can put your um, script together. He can then send you a message, say your script right to collect. You just come in, collect this. Um, for the patients, you know, you can set up alerts on their app. Um, you know, you've only got seven days left. You know, you need to organize your reorder. Um, you know, you need to take your medication now. Uh, and for the pharmacy or the, the big drug guys, you know, they love it because only about 50% of people from their research actually stick to what has been prescribed to them by the doctor slash pharmacist. So, you know, the more they're adhering to their um, treatment plan, the more that they're uh, going to be, I guess, consuming the drugs and that's going to improve sales for the pharmaceutical guys. The, they also give the pharmaceutical guys an ability to talk to patients. So if they've done further research, uh, as people maybe know, you know, once a drug gets approved, that doesn't end the research stuff. You know, they continue researching you know, taking it in conjunction with maybe another drug actually improves overall efficacy. Um, and now with coronavirus, we've seen um, some of the national health guys, you know, getting programs out there, pushing messages to people through their platform. They've got about 1.3 million patients in Australia on there, about 60% of all pharmacies in Australia. So, you know, Chemist Warehouse, Terry White are on there. But they're actually taking their technology overseas, which is probably the most exciting part. They're, you know, doing a big implementation for a big uh, pharmacy chain in the US. Uh, it's consuming a lot of capital um, to get the integration uh, in place. Um, but they're also looking at, you know, the UK. They've just done um, a partnership deal with um, a big pharmacy group there. And they're going into the Philippines, Malaysia. So they've got quite a lot going on, but their Australian business is profitable. If you like look at their accounts, you can see, okay, this is what it could look at at scale in a particular market. And then I think if you replicate that out for success in other markets, 
um, you get a you get a sense of where this uh, business can go. One of the things I like about it, which you very very rarely see in micro caps, their last three placements have kind of brought on three significant shareholders, um, but their placements are all done at premiums to the last traded price which, you know, even in good times is very rare to see. So EBOS, the big um, New Zealand healthcare outfit, their substantial shareholder came in at a premium to the price at the time. Sigma Pharmaceuticals are a smaller shareholder, but also came in at a premium. And more recently, um, HMS Holdings, which are a big NASDAQ listed digital health business um, out of the States, came in at a... Um, at a premium as well, they're now a 13% shareholder. So, you know, all of those things like pique my interest, you know, if a $2.5 billion market cap, you know, US healthcare firm decides to take a stake in a then $75 million Australian micro cap, you know, that's got to, you know, that's got to prick your ears up. It reminds me of um, when I can't remember the name of the US company, but they took a position in uh, Spookfish before it got um, taken out. Um, yeah, eagle. That would, that's it. I knew it was some kind of bird. Um, I was thinking Phoenix Technologies. Um, but you know, it, you know, why why would they be crossing the globe with all the opportunities that are in you know the American tech market or startup market to be investing in a microcap over here if they haven't you know done a lot of work in terms of the. I guess the functionality, the product, and the potential for the product. So yeah, Med Advisors probably one I've followed closely for two. The other thing I'm very impressed with Med Advisor is they just appointed the new chairman, uh, who is Chris Ridd. Uh, Chris was the Microsoft country manager for Australia for 15 years, um, and then he was the country manager for Zero in the early days. I actually met Chris as part of the Zero IPO roadshow. Very impressive um, when he was in that business. The CEO is a guy called Rob Reed, who's from a deep healthcare background. So I think they've got a great management team in place there. They've got Chris, who's got, you know, deep IT experience from both Microsoft at the enterprise level and zero in terms of a startup and scaling. And then you've got Rob, the CEO, who's from a deep healthcare background, who understands, you know, the networks and linkages between insurance, hospital groups, patients, pharmacies, doctors how it all works. So uh, I think yeah, if I had one pick on a kind of three to five year view, it'd, it'd be Med Advisor. Brilliant. And Paul, just uh, a couple of people missed the, the first company you referred to. So if you just do a quick shout out to them again before I throw to Ben. It's K2 Player, was it? K2 Player, yep. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So it's a mining, it's a software as a service company selling mining, uh, selling uh, software to mining companies uh, a lot of them are uh, New York, they're listed on New York Stock Exchange. They have to meet new regulations by January 2021 and their RQ'd solution, which uh, handles resources and reserve reporting, meets it meets all the, the criteria that for these changes in regulation. So um, there's a lot of interest uh, coming from companies, global companies like Rio Tinto, Vale, New, Newmont, that, that are buying the software as opposed to going and developing their own solution. So they're growing very quickly. Brilliant. Now, Ben, a change of tact a little bit for you. Um, yep. We talked about uh, the number of raisings and the surprising number of raisings that have come into the market, particularly the, the top end and the bottom end. Um, where's all this coming from? You know, the, is it the super funds coming in, are private investors, is it um, existing shareholders, is it, is it offshore? Are we seeing any, at the micro small cap end, are we seeing any, any trends of where the money's coming from? Uh, look, I think, you know, it's, it's it, we went through a period after the, the 20th of Feb where, you know, the market really dropped away and everyone sat on their hands. I think obviously a lot of people moved to a more cash position as well and, and, and sort of brought back their portfolio. There's interest at all levels. You know, we've had our, our busiest month life to date. You know, we've had... Um, I think we've had more bid this month than January to August last year. Uh, so like just a crazy, crazy amount of interest at the top end, you know, you've got overseas funds and interest where the Australian dollars dropped. So all of a sudden it's even bigger discounts. Um, 
But you know, if you're getting 10 to 20% discount on a lot of these stocks, uh, it's not so much, you know, the problem isn't really where the money is coming from. The problem is, can I get in? That's the biggest thing at the moment, getting access to them. The hot big deals are getting taken up and, you know, we're seeing in the AFR recently, the ASX just updated their um, policy as well. Actually, um, for those of interest, the ASX just put out a, a capital raising note today and the investor update, if you're on their list, it's a really good note. It's quite, goes into this in quite a bit of depth. But um, even at the small end, you know, there was a, uh, a two and a half million dollar raise today where we were sort of just helping out and had well over a million dollars of interest in it. Um, and, and like, it's just, it was very, very well bid. Um, I think the people are starting to maybe think, you know, the market's come up a bit uh, and there's some good opportunities there. And people have already made a lot of good money off it. Um, I think just to, just to quickly touch on, on the stock point before that everyone was running through my uh, tips. So we don't give advice. So I'm not going to, uh, <laughs> I'm not going to succumb and name stocks, but I think the biggest thing that people sort of touched on there, uh, whether it was actively or, or not. And, and the biggest part that will come through is who are the management? Like who is at the helm of these companies? You know, most of us on this call run our own business and life in a COVID world is hard. It's hard managing employees. It's hard managing lease obligations. Um, it's hard, you know, to conduct business over mediums like this rather than sitting down in a cafe with someone or over a beer. It's just a different environment. And I'd say the, the companies that are really going to come through are the ones that have very dedicated and very capable people at the helm. Uh, and that would, that would be my tip. That would be, you know, the number one thing to look at. Um, number two, just on a, on a price point of view, is just to remember at the small end of town, we're very illiquid, right? So, you know, there's a lot of stocks that only trade 10, 20, 30 grand a day, uh, you know, right at the bottom end, where if someone needs to exit $100,000 and it's got nothing to do with the stock, that's going to have a big impact on the day on price. Uh, and that's, you know, that's just supply and demand. Um, and, and that's just going to pull through. So you see a lot of stocks that have been oversold that have bounced back um, quite a bit, and they'll be more susceptible to price movements. And, Angie, a question for you. We're seeing a lot of interest, both media interest and investor interest in, in stocks that are very closely aligned to the virus thematic, whether it be food delivery, hand sanitizers, yep. uh, you name it. For you, is that, without naming the companies, is that more a trading opportunity than a long-term view on the, on the sort of the investment, the investable nature of the business? Or are there some that will have a big light shone on them now that you'll go, well, actually, um, they did benefit from what's happened at the moment, but there's actually life well beyond the current situation for, for these, some of these companies? Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, yeah, for uh, some of my new investments that I had invested in before, definitely some of those food delivery boxes where, you know, you cook the food at home. So in, in a, um, a local one, and I'm also in one overseas. And I just think, you know, people in this environment, they will, rather than going out to the supermarket, they will like a box of food delivered where they can cook the meal at home. And then they might get used to doing that and think actually that was quite handy not having to go and source those groceries and and I think some, you know, definitely some businesses like that people will utilize some of these services even zoom you know these zoom calls I'd never used zoom or any of these platforms before and I think this will become you know very popular going forward so absolutely and I, I was going to say uh, across that too David is I always like when I when I've done talks before I like to tell the people that I think you should all pretend you're in a shares race so every couple of weeks, pretend you're picking for the shares race. And I actually take, I'm a bit competitive about it and it'll take a couple of hours to do it. Um, but, you know, you sit down and say, okay, well, if I had to go in a shares race, what would be the 10 stocks I would pick? And I would have to hold them for four weeks. And I think by just going through that process, you do tend to look at these high flyers. You think, okay, well, what's happening in the world? All right. Well, what, what stocks will do well, what stocks are being talked about, what's hot at the moment. And then you would sort of look at your other stocks that didn't make the, the list and think, well, why am I holding 
those particular positions and you might say to yourself, well, you know, they've got a lot of, you know, their logistics centre in China's closed down. They won't be able to get stock. I won't put them in the race. But So why are you still holding that stock? So um, I think that it directs us to those sort of businesses that will do well in the current environment and they're being talked about. They've got a, a lot of activity because you might come across a really amazing business that might do well in this in these conditions, but no one will be following it. There'll be and and just like we're saying before about you know Ben was saying about the liquidity, you know, some of these stocks don't have any liquidity. And if no one's interested in that particular company, even though they might be doing well in the environment, you still need to have a bit of a lift in the price. Yeah, but I think some some of the new positions I've taken, I think they will continue on. And Paul, well. similarly for you, you obviously take a longer term view as well. Um, are there any opportunities that you're looking at now going, look, this, this new normal um, is now teaching me or introducing me to stocks that I may not have looked at before um, that, that are benefiting now, but I think will benefit as, as sort of the community goes to a, a different situation or a different environment moving forward? Uh, for me, I, I, I mean, I'm, what I'm looking for is in the current environment where things are uh, movements are restricted, I'm looking for companies that can actually remotely deploy their solutions without having to have people around. Because I mean, this this situation we're in now could go for the next year. Uh, I don't think we'll be locked up for a year, but certainly uh, there'll be restrictions. I think on international travel, and if companies are trying to sell things offshore, um, like I said before, you. you if you can't, if you have to do it directly, then it's going to make life very difficult. So, what we look for is companies that are going to thrive in in an environment where you, where it's difficult to to travel. And you know, um, one of the private uh, companies we're involved with called Deco, which is um, which is involved in communication and workflow. It's all it's all about online creating an online platform that's like a, a, a Dropbox, a Slack, uh, uh, email. It'll have voice and video shortly, all rolled into one, and, it, and it's encrypted. Now, people, if people are going to be uh, operating in this environment, you need security. And I think that was really pointed out last week um, when Zoom got hacked, and, and it's been happening in schools. And so, you know, you, you got to think, it, you got to bring your focus into what's important, and and you know one of the things certainly is is security. And Mark, do you have a view? Do you think there's some of the, the current sort of hot thematic around COVID uh, uh, stocks that are benefiting that will um, there'll be a number that will probably drop away over time, and and they'll have their moment in the sun, but there'll be some that'll that'll soldier on through, and actually, um, as Angie mentioned people's uh, way of living changes, which means these be these stocks may benefit. Yeah, I think, look, in microcaps, I always find there's, there's always some hot theme. I mean, I can remember when rare earths was a big theme. I can remember when graphite was a big theme. Nickel stocks last year was a big theme. Um, there's always some big theme. The, in microcaps, there's always some big theme and, you know, things like race ahead. Um, for the ones that are racing ahead now, like Marley Spoon and a, a few others, just, just to name them, uh, I worry about where the new base is going to be. I think, you know, they're getting a lot of business now, but when it resets back to kind of a more normal environment where people kind of go back to their old habits, like, um, I think the base is going to be higher, but how much higher is the question? And then does that translate into some kind of, you know, reasonable valuation? So for, I generally stay away from hot's hot. Um, uh, you know, momentum trading was never any of my uh, strong points. Um, but that's my worry for, you know, a lot of these ones that have risen on the back of COVID-19 is, you know, when things hopefully get back to normal, you know, whether that's in three months time, six or 12, you know, what does their new base business look like? I, I'd probably be in the view it, it is higher, but from the peak now back down to new this new base level, like how much is it going to drop and what does that give you as a kind of employed valuation from there? And in terms of, um, you touched on before, Ben, um, sort of the need for a, a large number of the smaller micro cap companies to raise capital before Christmas, yeah. essentially to survive. Um, 
we had a trend, I suppose, over the last 12, 18 months where we went from RTOs to IPOs. For a lot of these companies to survive, um, they either sort of just drop off the face of the earth because there's no money to fund them or they change their spots and become something new. Um, and this will be a question for the panel, but Ben, do you think you'll we'll see more RTOs coming back to the market of these smaller companies because it really is their only way to survive? Or is the changes to ASX listing rules going to make that difficult and they will just fall off and never come back? I think, uh, I, I don't think there's any drive by the ASX or ASIC to really um, remove these companies from the bourse. I think it's, uh, if you look at the, you know, the GSC is kind of the yardstick for this stuff. Uh, IPOs dropped from $20 billion raised to two, so a fall of 90%. And secondary raising, so placements, uh, entitlement offers, and SPPs, uh, grew from 50 to 80. So there was more money raised post GFC than pre. It was just raised by existing companies, and that's, you know, that's that's a good thing to be an existing company. It means you can you can buy a competitor out. It might not be an RTO. It might be that they have the ability because they have access to public like to money on the public market that they've got the ability to buy other companies. Um, I was talking to a company yesterday and they basically, that's exactly what they've done. They've, they've bought a, a, a business for, um, I think 1.2 million, uh, net of cash. So, you know, it's a small business that will probably add that much in revenue to its, to its turnover. So there's a lot more opportunities for stocks that are listed. Um, one other point I'd probably make just, on, on the topic before is I think that the, you know, the market and, and the feedback that we get from a lot of brokers is the market has factored in COVID. The market hasn't necessarily factored in the economic impact of COVID yet because it's so unknown. We're seeing numbers start to come out now of, of um, key indices that are, that are quite down, sort of 10 to 50% down, you know, Unemployment in Victoria, at least, uh, you know, is going to go to 10% and would be a lot higher, but for JobKeeper. Um, you know, how many, it's little things like, you know, there's, there's, there's lots of people on the call. How much are we spending on coffees now versus, you know, what we were spending at the start of the year? Um, you know, getting breakfast on the way to work, having drinks on a Friday. You know, all of that discretionary spend dries up that has such large flow on impacts. Um, I think it's, you know, it's the first time I've definitely noticed that uh, stocks are being ranked, are they a essential service or not um, as well? So there's all these sort of things coming back in. The, the other thing I'll just quickly say is, um, you know, May is loss selling month, right? So uh, we, we haven't had May yet. And that's, that's kind of a bit scary for me. Like, uh, I'm sort of looking at stocks saying, well, are they going to be the ones that people want to sell to materialize their loss? And is that going, like, what's that going to do to their share price? Um, and what news flow do they have coming through? Like, you know, David and Mark, what you guys do to help companies promote themselves is going to be so much more important over the next, you know, three to six months um, as, as they sort of try and come out of this, Lull. And Paul, you're sort of there at the corporate and the cap raising end. Do you think we'll see a trend towards RTOs versus IPOs, or is it is it too early to call? Uh, look, it's too early early to call. I think uh, we're, we're actually in the process now of evaluating the uh, the choice of going to, through to an IPO, or we've got a shell that's available for one of the companies, which our unlisted companies, and we are. Literally yesterday and today, we started looking at the pros and cons of it because uh, if, if there aren't really any advantages to um, doing a, an IPO over an RTO, then the obvious choice probably would be an IPO because to me, there's a similar amount of work. You've got to do a prospectus. You've got to go through all that, um, you know, all the rigmarole with the ASX recompliance. So, you know, I think there may not be... Um, uh, any great advantage in in um, in doing an RTO, and I think the ASX it, well, they have a two year limit, and then they delist you. So there could be a lot of companies 
left wanting for not having an opportunity and not being able to meet that that deadline. Um, one other thing which I'd say for in the current environment, I think structurally there, there could be structural changes that are going to happen out of this, which could affect the economy. And I agree with what Ben was saying about the, we haven't yet seen the full economic impact flow through. And, and I think that's probably why we're starting to see a bit of a sell off this week on the uh, indices again, because of that information starting to flow through. But I think there could be some structural changes coming. Um, you know, if, if I was running a business and, and it's able to, you're able to do a lot more work remotely, I might not need such a large office anymore. You know, and uh, retailers, a lot of people might be buying stuff online. They might continue to do that, which will make it even harder for bricks and mortar stores. So I think there could be some structural changes that, that flow yeah, through. On, on that, there's, there's going to be a lot of people, there's obviously a lot of businesses impacted by COVID. And there's going to be a lot of people using COVID as an excuse for things like that. Mm. Um, because, you know, we are learning to do things differently. This is a prime example, right? Like how long ago would it have been that none of us would probably have sat in our lounge rooms uh, or studies and, and, and had something like this with dozens of investors on, on the call. We'd all be, you know, in the office um, with a nice views, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, uh, this is all fine now, right? Like there's just, there's, there's a different mindset. And just to leave, uh, I'm conscious that we've just sort of hit the hour mark and while uh, everyone is still much engaged, um, uh, I, I'm conscious of uh, people's other, other needs and things they need to be doing. Um, maybe just in a, a last uh, sort of round the group and I'll start with Angie. If you've got uh, clearly our attendee list and registrants for people who uh, are investing in small and micro cap stocks. If you could give them one piece of, and I won't call it advice, I'll call it information. If you could give them one piece of information to help guide them in their investing uh, pursuits over the next month or two, what would it be? I always like the idea of having a trading plan. I think everyone should definitely have a trading plan. You need to know um, when you would invest in anything and, and just a plan of what you're going to invest in. So, I, I like the idea of always scanning the whole market. Like when I'm picking for the race or I'm looking for investment ideas, I, I definitely run scans over the whole market um, within my sort of parameters. I have certain parameters and I have a way of sorting them. And then always, always that way you're getting ideas that you, you just wouldn't come across before. So it's not like you've read a newsletter or, or someone's given you a hot stock tip. You've actually run a little search that you've done some work on and, and it's called up some interesting companies that, that you would discover. And also knowing what your stop is, at what point you have a set stop and you're very careful about your stops and watching directors' trades and, and watching, you know, for bad news and things coming up and, and being prepared to exit the investment and move on. And that way you've got cash for other investing. And I, I find uh, I mean, investors that I speak to, you know, they're, they're often always looking for the hot tips, but not focusing enough on, on the exit and the stop. Um, Paul? Um, research would be what I'd say. You've got to look at what, uh, what, what the companies have, look at the people that are running it, make sure that the, the, the product that they have is unique, globally scalable, and that it, it, it's got longevity. And, and uh, yeah, do, do a, a lot of research, whether that's through looking at other other people's uh, research by brokers, or I mean, we have all our sort of long term stocks. We've got them on a on our web web website under uh, opportunities. You just go and get information from different sources and build up a a picture of a company before taking that plunge. And Mark. Uh, um, kind of similar to Paul, I'd say, um, you know, this is the time to throw the net far and wide. Um, so I think one of the things I always advise people to do is, you know, the ASX announcements page on their website, look at that at the end of kind of every trading day and anything with like a kind of a, that little red um, exclamation mark, just like click into it. Uh, you probably mightn't even know the stock, but it's a great way to find new names and, and new stories. Um, and then for stuff that you have in your portfolio, like I, I, I always, I kind of agree with Angie, you know, you got to really know what you're invested in because in times like this where you've got big drawdowns, 
then you can you know what you should be doing. Should I be buying more, taking advantage of it coming down? Should I be selling to get out? Should I just be holding? Am I happy with the kind of position I know? But having that contextual awareness of where your portfolio is at, you know, allows you to take advantages of these big moves, um, whether it's on the downside or if you know we this snapback, you know, continues to 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 rally up. You know, maybe it's a chance to sell out of things. You know, maybe you think they're getting a bit too ahead of themselves. So I would say, yeah, uh, throw the net far and wide for in the search of new stuff. And for your existing portfolio, make sure you really, really know that well. So when the days of the big price moves come, you know what you should be doing and, and, and action that. And Ben, maybe from a slightly different perspective, so was a, a actual investor, but someone who watches a lot of the, the placements and things going through, what, what would you be suggesting? Yeah, look, I, I, I sort of just talk about being prepared, which I think is what everyone is kind of touching on as well. You know, I think you can only take advantage of it if you're ready to, if you've got cash, um, because, you know, as, as Andrew and Paul said, you've exited things that, or, you know, partially exited things that have, that have done well for you. I like the, um, what was it, Paul, a golden basket? Is that, you're, you're a yes, yes, that's what I call it. That is a cl- uh, I want a few golden baskets, they sound <laughs> fantastic. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, I think just getting ready. So make sure, you know, the traditional broking world is um, relationship based as well. So, you know, make sure you're calling your broker and staying top of mind. A lot of these, you know, from a raise point of view, at least a lot of them come and go quite quickly. So, you know, just just make sure you got some cash and make sure you're, you're sort of keeping track of everything. Great advice. And I'd like to thank each of you for participating uh, in the webinar today. Um, uh, I think the attendees by the range of questions and the, the, the fact that everyone stayed on tells me that Uh, The topic was well liked and you guys gave some excellent insights. Uh, A question has been asked and and, uh, in relation to how often we're looking to do this, we are looking to do this uh, sort of on a weekly basis. Um, And if the existing panellists will uh, happy to contribute, then we'll we'll keep going with them. And if they're they're, uh, out of action for a little while, then we're happy to swap people in and out. Um, But we think it's important that in this time, particularly that investors get access to a raft of different people to, Um, bounce ideas off, hear ideas, um, get suggestions because um, education is really, really important for all investors. So I'd like to thank each of the panellists, Angie, Mark, Paul and Ben for participating and for giving uh, your time um, and such great advice. And I'd also like to thank our attendees for participating and actively asking a lot of questions and, uh, um, and staying focused on what we're talking about. So each of you, thank you very much, and we'll uh, be meeting there. But uh, thanks, have a great night, and we'll uh, be in touch soon. Thank thanks. you, David. Thank you very much for organising it. Yeah, yep. thank, you. thank you very much. Yeah, cheers, thanks, David. Yeah, thanks, thanks a lot, David. Thanks for having me on. Thank you, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.